Thanks, team, for helping us prepare for this next section of Scripture in James. It's in chapter 4, and two of the words that we're going to see contrasted, not just today, but over the next four weeks, are the words pride and humility. Can you say those two words with me? Pride and humility. If you've ever raised children, if you've nannied, if you've babysat, if you've been a grandparent, if you've been around a child, if you've been in the nursery, if you've been to a ball game, <laughs> uh, if you've done anything where you've had to kind of corral kids and lead them, you know what these two words can mean. Because these two words, pride and humility, they end up with this question typically. Is like, like, you ever ask this question, like, why can't you guys just get along? You ever ask that to your kids? Or maybe to the ones you were babysitting or the ones you were nannying or the ones you were coaching. I know we've had several family meetings. Julie and I would pull the kids together. When, this is when they were all home and smaller. And sometimes we were at our wits end. We found out refereeing didn't work because you couldn't see everything and know all the details. And so we'd say, you work it out. But sometimes that ended up with the, the strongest always winning. And so that wasn't always the best. And so we'd pull them together and simply say, out of frustration, why can't you guys just get along? You know, and sometimes you appeal just to their sense of guilt, right? And <laughs> emotion. And pride and humility show up like that, don't they? And so we ask ourselves, what is going on? Why do we fight so much? And why all the quarreling? That's exactly the question James begins chapter 4 with. As he gets into a discussion of pride and humility. He wants to know, why all the fighting among you believers. So this question James asks, it's as old as the first century, as current as Donald and Ted, and as close as your own home. Why is there so much fighting? Just to let you know who he zeroes in on, I think there are 13 mentions of the pronoun, the plural pronoun you, it's always plural here, directed to the dispersed Jews. I think he's speaking to the Christian community, by the way. Why so much quarreling and fighting? He's going to ask that question. And he does in verse 1, doesn't he? Are you there in your Bibles? What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? He's wanting to know what is the root of this and I think implied in this question is there's a lot going on. What's causing this? And here's what I love about James. James never backs away from giving the answer straight out in a laser-like fashion. He says, it's this, that your passions are at war within you. Now, he unpacks that answer over the next chapter and a half. I believe the theme of these two words, pride and humility, run through about chapter 5, verse 6. So we're going to take four weeks and examine... This idea of, of fighting and quarreling and humility and pride in a kind of a mini-series called Winning the War Within. Because what James does is he says there are definite external issues going on, but the root of it, the cause of it, the culprit is what's internally going on. And he unpacks that in the next chapter and a half. So we're going to kind of follow along over about four weeks and look at this, this war within us and actually how to win it. Today's goal is to get through verse 6, which I think is the first natural break. I will take one question today because we've got a lot to cover today, not just in the message, but also some introductions of elders and deacons, a lot to do today. So I'll just take one question, and then I want to kind of give you an anatomical approach to winning the war within, all right? So let's kind of understand what James means when he asks the question, why so much fighting and what's causing it, verse 1, and when he gives the answer... He said, it's from your passions that are at war within you. Let's understand more about that in these first six verses, can we? I tend to think he puts these dispersed Jews on trial, if I could use that language. He kind of comes, comes at them in somewhat of a lawyer-like way with an indictment in verses 1 through 3. I think verse 4, he kind of gives a verdict. And in verses 5 and 6, and this is kind of a loose division he some, in some way gives kind of a sentence. So can we approach it that way? Can we kind of enter the courtroom with James for a bit? Hear his indictment? 
understand his verdict and see what his sentence is? Then again, like I said, I'll, ask, I'll, I'll take at least one question. If you have more, text them in. I'll try to get to them this week. Um, and then I'll end, hopefully, with some maybe anatomical ways to, to hopefully win the war with them. Here's his indictment. He asks a question, what causes quarrels, what causes fights, why all the strife? He says it's because of your passions at war within you. Now notice something here. You won't see this in your English translation, but here the word passions is not the word used earlier for strong desire or lust. Now when I say the word lust to you, you typically think of something bad and wrong. But in the Bible, most of the time, the word simply means strong desire. It's not always negative. It just means someone's got a very strong desire. Here, however, the word is the word hedone, or it's where we get our word hedonistic. James is actually saying, you know what's causing all the strife and the wars and the fightings among you? It's your desire to have your own way. In one sense, you could say to have your own way in excess. You, just, you want anything you can get to pile upon all of your, your greed. and I mean, it's your way at all cost. You want to live the life of a hedonist. <laughs> That's what he's saying here. These passions that just, just run crazy in your life. You can't say no to yourself. This is what's causing quarrels and fights. And he says they are at war within you. I love the way James here admits there's a war going on. Look how he now describes this war within the people. I think corporately and individually, personally. He says you desire and you do not have, but that's not enough. In other words, someone, and by the way, the word desire here is the word for lust. It's the word epithumia, so it's different than the word passion. Do you see what he's saying? You have a strong desire, but... When you don't get it, you're not content with no for an answer. You have to have your way. You have to move from just a strong desire to hedonism. I've got to get it at all cost. And so he says, when you desire and you don't have, then you murder. You break out in violence in order to get your way. I don't know that. And now watch this. Textually, we want to stay true to the text. I don't know that desiring and not having is so evil in and of itself. Do you catch that? He simply makes a statement, doesn't he? You desire and you don't have. Like, if you could end there, that wouldn't be so bad. A strong desire, but I can't have it, I can live with that, right? Isn't that kind of the way life is sometimes? We don't always get our way, right? But he says here, when you get to that point, you're not content. Then you have to move on to this hedonistic place where you will commit violence and you'll do things that are wrong to get your way. You can't. Be told no, apparently. This is like little children, isn't it? He says you, you covet. The word here, the root of this is zealous. You have this intense desire again, but you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. Same words as used in verse 1, exact same words. One, by the way, speaks of more like a broad series of battles. That's the word fight. The quarrel seems to be more individual struggle, hand-to-hand -hand combat was used in that way often. So he's speaking here of just all kinds of ways they go to war to get their way. He says, you do not have because you do not ask. Now this is an interesting phrase because in, within this phrase, he never says you do not ask God, does he? Now I'll tell you where, tell you where I am on this. I think that's implied because of the context. He talks about God uh, later on, being their uh, friend and having grace for them and, and, and desiring to be in a relationship. So I think the implication is God is the one to ask. But I do think it's interesting. He never says you don't ask God. He just says you don't have because you don't ask. Could he maybe mean that even with the general needs among the Christian community, they weren't asking for help with their needs? And we knew they were in need because of James 1, right? They were in great Temptation, trial, turmoil, persecution had broken out. Maybe they had legitimate needs, but they didn't legitimately ask a brother or a sister. They just kind of undermined and kind of sabotaged the body to get their way no matter what. Just, just a thought. I think, he probably, I think he means you don't ask God, but it is interesting here. He does not say that. He simply assumes it. You don't have because you don't ask, but when you do ask, you don't receive it. Why? Because you ask what? Wrongly. To spend it on your, say it with me, passion. Same word as in verse 1, your hedonism. 
So do you catch the, the context? Do you catch the drift? Here are people with strong desires that may not in and of themselves be wrong, but when they realize we're not getting our way, they move to a place that is wrong because they have to have their way, they feel. And so getting their way at all cost in the wrong way becomes their, their normal operating procedure. And it, is, it results in all kinds of fights and quarrels and strifes. But the real problem isn't the church fights and strife and quarrels. The real problem is these people cannot be told no. <laughs> Do you, do you catch this, guys? The real problem is not what's happening on the outside. The real problem is what's happening on the inside. Because somebody say amen to that. Speaking of raising children. Brooke, I'm sorry I have to be in this sometimes. I, I mean, I don't know how you handle it. <laughs> but I can recall sometimes moving with our kids when they were littler. And realizing that Julie and I, we couldn't solve the problem externally. Have you ever been there as a parent? You're like, I, I can't seem to fix this. Because then, and then it hits you like the problem's not on the outside. The problem's not another rule, more policies in the family, a stronger curfew, a tighter leash. We can do that. But you had this sense like this is not going to solve it because the problem's not external. The problem's where? In the heart of the person. I, mean, I, I know this frustration. And I know it not because of children. I know it because of my own life. You ever been looking in the mirror? You're dealing with your own sin. And you're asking yourself, what can I do? And, and you're, you're out of external options, aren't you? There's no more filters to add to your computer. There's no more rules. There's no more accountability partners left. You've run through 12 guys. There's no more couples to get mentored by. Somewhere the, the issue is just deep down tucked inside. You've got some passions at war in your life. This is Attorney James indicting the dispersed Jews and saying, here's the real problem. It is seen on the outside, but it is caused by what's inside. And so he then next screams out the verdict. And I, I need to warn you, this is strong language. I've gave, I gave some families a heads up because this does not need to be G-rated this morning. It won't be NC-17, don't worry. But I need to speak to you as James spoke to the people, and I think in light of his Old Testament. He was, he was a very religious and, and, and uh, devout Jew, James was. He was strong in that. I think he remembered the Old Testament several times in the writing of this book, by the way. Proverbs. Here I think he thinks of Jeremiah. I think he thinks of several places. I'll explain what I mean when he says in verse 4, You adulterous people. In the original, there's two variations on this phrase. Some manuscripts have just the feminine word adulteresses. That's all they have. It's translated, you adulterous people. Or um, some manuscripts have the masculine form adulterer and adulteresses. So that we call, in, in, in theology, we call that there's variations in the manuscripts, and so they tell you which has the most evidence, and you can work through that in classes that you don't need to take right now, okay? My point is this. However you look at this, James is saying to the dispersed Jews who are receiving this book, you are committing spiritual fornication. Now watch this. As our study group met about this passage... As Brad and I met, he's speaking in Bondurant this morning, as we met about this, here's what kept coming to our mind. I need you to hear this. That verses 1 through 3 talk about a war, yes. But verse 4 talks about a whore. Are you hearing this? You may think that's strong language. You may think, wow, that's, that's really explicit. That's... That's just out there. He's saying you're a prostitute spiritually. You're selling out and you're sleeping with, with the enemy. You're cheating on Christ. 
Now, if you think that's strong language, I need to bring you up to speed on the Bible's understanding of sin in the Old Testament especially, in the New as well. But in the Old Testament, when Israel would forsake the Lord their God and turn to idols, Yahweh, Jehovah, God, would refer to them as spiritual adulterers. He would say often, you have been a faithless wife. Which is why some say who believe that the original James may have wrote was just the word adulteress says. They think it was James's attempt to show a reference to the Old Testament by saying, you're supposed to be the wife, the, the bride of Christ, but you're sleeping with the enemy. You're loving the world. And so he uses the feminine form of the word adulterer. Adulterer says to show you're just like the Old Testament group called Israel. You're bowing down to idols. You're, you're running off to folks who, who aren't true lovers. You're forsaking your one true husband. This is explicit language on purpose. It's the language that I think the church needs to hear in today's age. Did you know that? If you'd like to read some explicit biblical language about what sin actually is, what embraced idolatry is to God, read Jeremiah 2. It contains some language that in verses 20, 21, and 22 that, and just to be frank with you here, I won't tell you what it actually translates from the Hebrew. There is no, there's no PG way the translators could translate Jeremiah 2, 20 through 22 in a way that would make sense for families or even us to read. See me after, I'll explain it to you. But it, 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 in those two verses, as well as 20 through 25 of Jeremiah 2, there is an extreme, it's probably the most uh, provocative language, Jeremiah 2 and 3 especially, those two chapters, in the Old Testament about Israel's wandering. And idolatry. I say that to you because I don't want you to, he to, to read this, this, hear this verdict, and just brush it aside. James is saying the reason there is so much fighting and strife is because you have these warring passions within you. And you are all, you're always tempted to betray your bridegroom. And when you do, when you go and sleep with the enemy, when Satan becomes your, your bad partner, don't be surprised that you always find fault with the bride. It's my personal opinion that personal spiritual adultery will always result in corporate um, relational animosity. Did you catch that? Personal, spiritual adultery. To some degree will always result in corporate, relational animosity. When I've got an issue with Christ and I'm cheating on Him, I'll have a problem with His bride. This is really what James is saying. The problem is seen externally, yes, but the cause of it is internal. We have these warring passions. And, and if I could just say it this way, it seems as though James is saying the war on the outside comes from the temptation to whore on the inside. Now, if you struggle with the fact that there's a war inside of you, if you struggle with the fact that there is a consistent battle happening within you, read Romans 6, all right? which is a chapter on victory, yes, but it's a chapter about victory in the middle of an ongoing struggle between our flesh and our spirit. In fact, I reread Romans 6 this morning. And in just reading that, several of the verses tend to lean us to understanding that, yes, we have victory now, and, there, and sin should not have dominion over us. It should not reign in our mortal bodies. And yet there are several times he says that, that the, the, the truest um, 
largest sense of victory will be when Christ comes and gives us a new body. Paul even said towards the end, who will ever deliver me from this body of death? He's, he feels this consistent war being raged. He talks about sometimes I, I find that I do what I don't want to do. And what I should do, I don't do it. Can anyone else agree to that? Are you with me? He talks about this ongoing struggle, even in a chapter about the victory we have. Romans 7, a continuation of some of these same principles. So if you're struggling with the fact there's a war within you, uh, I, I would just take that struggle and unvelcro it from your back because you live in a body tainted, corrupted by sins called your sin nature. It's at war with your new divine nature implanted to you by God when he saved you by his grace. And they will be at war till the day you shed that body and get your new one, okay? Now, I'm not saying you're set up for failure and that losing is just the way it is. I'm saying you're set up for a struggle. There is no sin in the struggle. Could somebody say amen to that? Amen? Man, we are in a battle. It's a temptation. It's a fight. We are always being tempted daily to betray our bridegroom, to be idolatrous and adulterous. Satan appeals to our pride to pull us away from our, our true spiritual husband, Jesus. So that struggle always exists, but there is no sin in the struggle. The sin comes when in the struggle we give in to temptation and sin. I'm simply saying to you, James is saying... You have a struggle, you have a war, and when you're told no, when you don't get your way, you're not content with that. You go to all measures to get it, and that is sin. Isn't this interesting how this fits the flow of the book? Remember James 1? When you're in trials, he says, ask God for wisdom, but don't accuse God falsely. Do, do you see the same idea? It can be a difficult time. We may not be just where we want to be. God may not be giving us or you may not be the exact place you think you ought to be. God could be testing you and trying you. But when those things occur, you don't get what you think you deserve or what you want. Don't blame God. Don't try to get your way at all costs. Humble yourself under God. Endure the trial. It's much the same thing here. Don't, don't, don't run to hedonism. Just because every strong desire you have doesn't get met. Instead, realize that when you do that, you're actually adopting the world's values. You're becoming an adulterous idolater, and you're loving the world, and you're not loving God. This is what verse 4 continues to say. Do you see this? Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? When you get your way at all cost, when you disregard any motives or methods, and you have to have your way, when pride rules you are aligning yourself with the world's values and you're at enmity with God. This is why John would say later, do not love the world. 1 John 2, verses 15, 16, 17. Do not love the world nor the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, they're not of the Father. They're of the world. Do you see how John draws a contrast, much like James and he does not leave like a neutral zone. When we were kids, we'd play capture the flag. I like that game because you could always, if you felt like you were in danger, you could get in the neutral zone. You couldn't get tagged or caught or flagged, you know. There's no neutral zone in this battle. Jesus said, if you're not with me, you're against me. James says here, if you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy with God. And he says here, don't make yourself an enemy of God. This phrase in verse 4, that if you wish to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God, is the crucial phrase to understanding verse 5. So he says that, that the real problem is on the inside. That's why we see the problems on the outside. And when we are straying from God, when we're loving the world, when we're idolatry, uh, when, we're, when we're adulterous and idolatry, he says here, that's, that's befriending the world and making an enemy out of God. But it's, it's we ourselves who are making ourselves an enemy of God because that is not God's goal for us. This is what verse 5 says. Look what he says. Do you suppose it is to no purpose the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? Now that's a very difficult phrase to translate. In fact, even as I read that, some of you have different translations. You thought, that's not what mine says. Some of you have a capital S for spirit. The ESV does not capitalize it. 
I land here, and this is like a, a, this is a very hard phrase, and we can disagree and remain really good friends, okay? You got that? I don't think he references the Holy Spirit here either. I think the ESV does a good job of this. I think what he's saying is this. It is not God's desire to be at war with people. He put a spirit in you that he desires to fellowship with, he, to, to, to be in communion with you. It's not God's desire to be at war with you, but if you choose to, if you make yourself an enemy by proudly resisting God, by getting your way at all costs and not humbling yourself under God, then he will oppose you. But it's not his desire to be in that, that war with you. God's desires want a friendship. Now, if you see the phrase differently, if you think it's the Holy Spirit, man, we can shake hands and be in the same small group, eat dinner, no problem, okay? I mean, legitimately, this is a very difficult phrase. I think the SV does a good job here. And he's simply showing us that it is not God's desire to be at odds with his people. It wasn't that way for Israel, was it? Remember Israel? He did everything he could to, to, to keep Israel from being an idolatrous people. Gave them a law, a system of, of relationships, blessings and cursings. He even told them, if you stray, this will happen to you. They strayed and it happened, right? It was not God's desire for Israel to be separated from him like that. It is not his desire in this situation here with his church either for, this, for there to be this enmity, this, this strife, which is why he gives us more grace. You see verse 6? God gives more grace to actually do what often we think we can't, which is to humble ourselves, to be content, to not have to get our way at all costs by all means. He gives the grace that makes that possible. But if we choose the world's values and the world's methods, the world's ways, he will oppose us. That's the way of the proud person. And the word oppose here means to stand against. You need to understand this, church. Listen very carefully. I've maintained this and still believe it, and I've told you this several times. You've been here longer than five or six years. You'll know this. But this word does not indicate that God is in the corner like, man, these proud people, they're pushing hard against me. I hope I can hold them back. I hope I can resist all the proud people that are, that are resisting me. This is a worrisome situation here. That's not the divine's response. Here's what God does when he sees pride continually rooted in your life and, and you acting in a way both externally and internally that you're going to get your way at all costs by all means. God comes at you with a full court press. This is an active word that God will oppose you. And often we've seen this played out to where sometimes it takes God breaking people and using situations and circumstances that seem incredibly painful but it was necessary for God to break them of their pride. And yes, did God do that? Yes. He opposed their pride. You with me? Why? So that he could humble them and bring them back to fellowship. So he could be, watch this, not an enemy any longer, but that he could overcome their will and bring them to surrender. Because God loves his church. He loves his people. And he wants to give grace to the humble. It's as a, this is a shocking set of six verses, is it not? Contrasting pride and humility, showing what's at the root of all of our quarrels, and then explaining that the truth is what's needed is a surrender, not to the world's call, but a surrender to God's sovereignty and majesty. And in that, he gives the grace to actually do the very thing that seems impossible. Live with people even when you don't get your way. You see, the key, now watch this, church. I'll say more in a minute. The key to living relationally in a way that doesn't always have conflict, it, it starts vertically. Did you know that? It starts living with your wife, living with your husband, living with your children, living with your parents. 
your small group, your coworkers, your boss. Living peacefully horizontally starts by living submissively vertically. That no matter what comes your way, God is in control. He's got this. He's got me. He's, he's bringing the best out of my character. And if he's using difficult times and difficult people to shape in my character to be more like Christ, I will submit to that. I will humble myself under God. I will accept his grace And you'll be surprised when that attitude vertically lines up, you'd be surprised the amount of horizontal dysfunction that would disappear. Your problem, if I could be this bold, is not with your wife or your husband. Most of the time, our problems are with God. And we don't like what he's doing through situations, then we rebel against him and it shows up in how we treat each other. This is what James is saying. There's a war within us. It shows up by what's happening outside of us. The real key to to winning the war on the outside is to win the war with inside. And how do we do that? By humbling ourselves under God's grace. Letting that have its greatest effect, first of all, here. And then seeing that play out among the body. Let me take a couple of questions. Well, just one question, then I'll give you our take-home truth, and I'll give you... Three little things to close. Can I do that? Are there any questions? There's no questions? Wow. I had thousands this week. I'm surprised you didn't have any. If you have some, send them in later. We'll try to address them. That's amazing. Um, well, if you do ask your lighthouse leader later today or this week, they'll, they'll have the answer, I'm sure, right? <laughs> let, let me show you kind of what, we're, what we've been saying then. Here's what we're seeing and saying in a simple sentence. And this is not real motivating. It's not going to be like real action-based. But it does give us the heartbeat of the text. I think it gives us truth that we can kind of hold on to in a way that will make us remember the text throughout the whole week. Will you read it with me? The war with pride is seen externally, birthed internally, but won divinely. Does that make sense? So it's not real complicated. There's no real play on words in some ways. This doesn't call you to a certain kind of action. But it, it does, I think, teach us something that's very important. The war with pride that we're all battling on a day-to-day basis. Your consistent battle against betraying your bridegroom and getting your own way all the time, that is seen externally. Let's not try to cut any corners here. We, we see that in the body, in our families. But that is not what's causing it. Your, your, your problem is not the person to your right or left. <laughs> because those quarrels and fights that we see, they come from the passions at war within us. So our war with pride is birthed internally. How do we deal with that? We win that battle divinely by God's grace. Now, I think it's important for me to give you three anatomical responses to this truth. All right? They're not suggestions today because they come right from the text. But I'll word them in a way that that I think will help us think about what James is saying. I think, first of all, we should start with our own heart. He says they come, these quarrels and fights, they come from what's within you, the passions. And he kind of directs the people to look inside their heart, doesn't he? You're having all of these strong desires. You're not getting your way. And so then you cross the line. Instead of saying, staying in humility and accepting things, you cross the line towards hedonism, and whatever means or method or motives are involved, you will get your way at all cost. He said, that's a heart problem. So James is asking people to start with their heart. And I would just say to you, that's good advice for all of us. Look in the mirror before you look out the window. Start with your heart. When you're in the middle of a quarrel, a fight, when you find yourself asking, why can't we just get along? <laughs> Start with your heart. I've discovered that when Julie and I have disagreements, can I ask? okay, I'll just say, when we fight, 
And we fight well. We fight honestly. We fight correctly. It, it, it always goes better when both of us say, hey, what's going on in my heart first? To ask, you know, okay, what, what's happening here? And what, what is it I'm really after? Is there, and she does the same thing. It, it's a start, start with your own heart. What's awry there? What's amiss there? What's wrong there? Every quarrel, every struggle, every fight, if you'll start there, it's a good place to begin winning the war. By the way, that doesn't mean that no one else has fault, but I'm asking you to start with your own heart. Does that make sense, guys? Start with the mirror, not the window. Begin here. Lay yourself out before God. Say, God, and more than likely, what I've discovered in my own experience is the Lord will, by His Holy Spirit, He'll dissect your motives, and you'll find, man, I'm, <laughs> I'm not clean as a whistle like I thought in this. <laughs> you know, I, I, I got some issues, don't I? And, man, if you start there, uh, the rest of the process may still be difficult, but it won't be rooted in pride and protection. You follow me? Good. So start with your own heart. Have the courage to begin in the mirror. Second thing is this, continue to your mind. I draw this from a couple of the verses in which he does this. Look what he says in verse 4 and 5. He says, do you not know? He says in verse 5, do you suppose? So he's appealing to their ability to reason here. Did you know that? He's saying, guys, I know you feel something strong in your heart. You don't get your way, so you will get it at all costs, by all means, no matter if they're if they're violent, if they're abrasive. But guys, don't you know what that is? That's enmity with God. Can't you reason with me that if you adopt that lifestyle, that's actually aligning with the world and not with your Heavenly Father? He's appealing to their mind to think through what their actions actually are saying. So as you work through quarrels and strife, as you start uh, winning the war within, start with your heart first and then continue to your mind. Reason about what your actions are actually saying. Watch this. What your actions are actually saying, not to those on the horizontal level, what are your actions actually saying to the one who bought you and owns you? What are your actions saying to your spiritual husband? Because when you adopt the world's values and mindset, when you... Sleep with the enemy when you go to bed with the world and commit fornication on Christ, your true spiritual love and husband. You're at war with God. That's pride in its most heightened, visible way. God sees that and he will oppose you. I'm asking you to think about this for a moment. I know that our feelings get in the way sometimes. Could we all say amen to that? But this is a time to, to reason and think, wow, I can't give in to these feelings to get my way at all costs by whatever means. That's just going to be adopting the world's values. And I don't want to commit spiritual adultery on Christ. So I will stay faithful and humble under Christ's sovereignty and trust Him, my one true spiritual husband. He will take care of me and meet my needs. So start with your heart first, continue your mind, and then Get to your knees. I like what he says. And by the way, the only contrasting word in these first six verses is the word but. You see that? But he gives more grace. I love that, don't you? In the middle of all of this strife we see and the war within us, it's like, wow, this is a gloom and doom picture. But he gives more grace. And so what do we do? We humble ourselves. I just tell you, we just get to our knees quickly. <laughs> That's the best posture to win the war. So three parts of your body are important in this war, this fight. Start with your what? Continue to your and then get to your I would suggest based on this text and the truth in it about how we see the war where it starts and how it's won that these three things would be a very good first step for all of us in winning the war with him. We're going to lay some more out over the next several weeks. 
In fact, I think verses 7 through 10, if I can just show you this in advance, I think verses 7 through 10 really just kind of lay out for us specific ways to be humble. Do you see the word humble at the end of verse 6? He says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the what? Humble. And then look at verse, uh, verse 10 now. What's the first word of verse 10? Humble. So between the word humble at the end of 6 and the word humble at the beginning of verse 10, he mentions all kinds of specific words like submit, resist, draw near, cleanse, purify, mourn, weep. What's he doing? He's showing specific ways that we can be humble. How does humility show up in your life? He's going to tell us next week. To more speaking, he'll kind of break these verses apart for us. The real point is, don't be proud against God and get your way at all costs by all means. That's idolatry and fornication on your true spiritual husband. Instead, trust God. Be humble under his grace. Stay faithful, not faithless. Let God meet your needs in his time, by his power, in his way. This is the call of the text. This is the way we fight the war. Starting with our heart, continue to our mind, and getting to our knees quickly. Aren't you glad that the real answer to this war, he gives it in verse, five, in verse 6, doesn't he? Grace to the humble. This grace comes from God. Aren't you glad that that answer is rooted in Jesus Christ. I mean, just this week, I was thinking through that verse. And I was so thankful. I was so thankful that I didn't need to come to you today with like some invented way to win this war. Like, well, I got to think of, you know, 15 tips and, and six, you know, uh, without fail remedies. No. You know what, what James does? He says, guys, the answer to the internal cause and the external effect is the grace of God. And where do we see the grace of God? In the person of a Jesus Christ. Can I just be blatantly basic with you? When you start with your heart, continue to your mind and get to your knees, that should always end up at the cross. Because the gospel, the cross of Christ, where the grace of God is so beautifully, terribly, and poignantly displayed, that's where the strifes and the quarrels cease. So I, I just bring to you the time-tested basic remedy for strife and quarrel, the only way to deal with the war within you. And it is the cross of Jesus Christ where he once and for all put down the enemy. Amen? If you think you can handle Satan on your own, you are, uh, no pun intended here, dead wrong. You need something outside of your own self. Jesus Christ died to make sure you did not have to surrender to sin but could instead surrender to God's grace. So I don't have any tricks up my sleeve. I've got no magic pill or silver bullet. I've got one tried and true message for all of us who war within ourselves and have to deal with the way that's expressed. I've got the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the cross of Jesus, amen? What do you say? We humble ourselves under his grace. And say, God, do a work here so that <laughs> I can get along here. Can we take that posture this morning? Let's pray together, shall we? All of our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We move to a time in which we remember that place of grace. where Jesus did for you what you could never do for yourself. He broke the power of sin. He humbled himself even to death on the cross. And in doing so, God destroyed the power of sin and death over his children. So the place of grace is not within you on your own. 
The place of grace is the cross of Christ. And that's where God's grace, that's where it's rooted and it's found. We come this morning to remember that place as we do every week. Lord Jesus, I admit it is hard living in a body that's prone to sin, that's racked with this war inside. We're consistently being tempted by our own desires. We have the world and the flesh as well and the devil pulling us away. But Lord, we know that you have won the victory already. You will consummate that one day when you, when you come and redeem our bodies and give us that new one. Until that day, by your Holy Spirit, we wrestle and fight and struggle within his power. So, so God, put us on our knees quickly and daily and put us on our knees at the foot of the cross where our greatest weapon and our greatest battle posture is one of humility under your grace as we battle the pride within our life. So I'm going to ask you to stand, but I'm going to ask you to keep in your heart a posture of humility. Would you stand first, family? And begin, if you would, to make your way to the communion tables. But even as you do, would you just remain in a humble posture before God? Would you approach this table, this spiritual meal we're eating together as believers, with a surrendering attitude to God's grace, knowing that that is, the, is the, the root answer for the war inside, the war on the outside. <laughs> that's, that's where we start. So God, shower us with your grace today. The grace of the cross of Christ. Church, go when you're ready. Get the elements and come back to your seat. Tim will come in a minute, one of our elders, and lead us through those as a body.